Dr. Svetlana Papazov, lead pastor of Real Life Church. You are joining a live broadcast of Real Life. Real Life is a very special faith community. We follow Jesus Christ, and we are not just listeners of the word, but we are doers of the word. That's what we aspire to do. And we are a church that is fully online, so we want to welcome you. If you don't have your own church, your own faith family, Christian faith family, that you would join us. If you're just exploring faith, you're just exploring God and want to know what's the big deal about Jesus, because our culture doesn't quite know what the name of Jesus does in our lives. We welcome you to come and explore that with us. We gather in a Zoom group, but we also go live for our broadcasts. So if you want to get our Zoom link where we, we have all kinds of exciting conversations and pray for each other, we activate each other into being doers of the word, then let us know. Drop us a comment in the, in the content um, that you're listening to right now, and we will send you the link. So today, you're joining us almost at the end of the first month of a new year. It is a Sunday and it is January. And usually the month of January, a lot of us do a whole bunch of soul searching. Uh, and I don't care if you, if you look at yourself as being a believer and a follower of Jesus or not. We all look deeply into who we are and we aspire to do better. We hope for a new beginning to be a better than the, the old, what we left somewhere in the past. But it seems like 2022 snuck on us and it looks like a lot of us are discouraged a lot of us are grieving a lot of us lost much in the last two years and the hope for a new beginning is waning we're only in the first month and when usually have it here a lot of new year's resolutions and hopeful um proclamations that people are going to do uh, this and that. None of that is happening. In most of our social media feeds, we see people, people going through a whole bunch of crisis and a lot of loss and a lot of despair. And it looks like 2020 and 2021 snuck right in 2022. And there isn't much hope to look forward to because things are not changing and they're not changing as fast as we want them to change. And what seemed to be maybe a short period of disruption turned into a way of life. And we're trying to figure out how we're going to continue. And today I want to talk to all of us that there is hope that there is hope for 2022 and that it is a new beginning and you can have a hopeful new beginning if you put your hope not in yourself or the circumstances around you but you put your hope in the one who holds your circumstances and some of you might be totally pushing back at me and saying oh nobody can really do life but me I am the one responsible for my own life. I agree with you. You're responsible for yourself, but you have an accountability of how you steward yourself and all the opportunities that come to you. But what we have all realized in the crisis, in this COVID crisis that has lasted now for two years, is that there are circumstances beyond us there are crises bigger than what we can control and we all the whole world has come to the realization that we are not the ones that can control it all there are circumstances there are crises uh, there are devastations that totally escape the control of the human being and it's not like you and i don't have the responsibility in the midst of a crisis but we are now figuring out that there is somebody beyond crisis 
that is actually the Lord of crisis, the Lord of the storms that humanity goes through. And he is patiently waiting for us as people to turn around to God, to call upon the creator of the entire universe, the creator of this earth, the creator of the human beings that are walking the earth in 2022 and say, we admit we cannot control it all and we relinquish this control and welcome you as the overcomer of all circumstances. I want to go ahead and read with you, open to Matthew. This is in the New Testament. It's, it's one of the Gospels. That's how the New Testament begins. So if you have a hard copy, you can, you can find Matthew chapter 14, or you can grab your smartphone and download the Bible app, and, and you can have it handy as well. But um, I always recommend get your hard copy. And uh, this way, you can jot in the margins. I use a pencil and you can jot in the margins and you can write as you get beautiful insights, as something captures your attention, write it in and it's there to stay. So we're going to read from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. It is a very interesting passage. The first followers of Jesus, his disciples, that have experienced Jesus in many circumstances, find themselves in a life-threatening crisis. They find themselves in this passage in a storm that is about to capsize their boat and they may lose their lives. So they are in a crisis situation. But it's interesting to note that this crisis situation comes right on the wings of a miraculous situation they're experiencing, something that is out of this world, because truly it was performed by Jesus Christ who came out of this world into this world to show God's mercy, grace, and love and forgiveness. So Jesus had just fed 5,000 people plus, you know, this is the men in the, um, at, at that time they were counting the men, but there were also women and children. So there was this humongous crowd and he fed them out of a handful of, um, of sustenance. There wasn't food for 5,000. He fed them miraculously. So his followers experienced that miracle. So that's interesting to know. Because we think that if we experience the presence of God, then we will always remember God is present, right? And if we experience the miracles of God, then we will always remember God is miraculous, right? Yeah, but wrong. <laughs> they literally, only a few hours later, they had forgotten what they have experienced. So I just want to encourage you, we're in the midst of crisis right now, in the midst of the COVID crisis that had just transpired into all kinds of other crises, you know, so it's health crisis, but then it's economic crisis, then it's a mental health crisis, and all kinds of other crises. And we're experiencing this place where we think there is very little hope for change. I just want to encourage you to remember who is the Lord of all and who overcomes all crises because the followers of Jesus in the first century very quickly forgot who is the Lord of it all and they found themselves in another crisis so the first crisis was hey everybody's gonna starve around here and we're gonna have people fainting and some of them dying because we're in a remote place if we don't give them food to eat some of them would really perish <laughs> so they saw God come through in that crisis and a few hours later they're forgetting God can and they go into another down spiral. Let's read. So again, Matthew 14, 22 to 33. So they had fed, you know, Jesus had fed the 5,000 and then immediately Jesus made the disciples after all that event was done and everybody was so tired <laughs> his disciples especially, because they were serving 5,000 people with, uh, you know, with the food that Jesus provided 
for them can you imagine yourself doing that you would be absolutely tired and just exhausted and so this is what jesus is doing he's thinking about their well-being so immediately jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd so he was gracious to them and gave them time to rest after he had dismissed um the people he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray so what jesus was doing is he was refreshing he went into the presence of god to refresh and pray when evening came he was there alone on that side of the bank you know where they were is on a kind of a steep bank going down uh to the sea and then on the other side, there is another steep bank. So that's kind of like the geography of their, uh, where they were. So when it says that he went up the mountainside, he had to come down now to the lake, right? And he needs to go to the other side where he sent his disciples, his followers, because they're going to minister on the other side to other people that really needed to hear the good news. <clears throat> So when every evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land. So he uh, sent them on ahead to rest. And uh, I don't know if he expected that they would just rest in the boat or, you know, just kind of like pull off a little bit and maybe wait on him and come back to pick him up. I don't know what conversation went, but the, fa the fact is when he finished praying and being refreshed himself, he went down. <laughs> Uh, and, and so that the the boat is way out there. So it was a, a considerable distance from land. And look at what the boat's condition was. Buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So he sees his followers in a storm you have to understand that this particular geography while the sea may look to be um quite flat and, and easy and and uh, doable to cross over out of nowhere southern winds would come down and, and would push against the vessels that are in the water so they will push against the boats and remember this is more than two thousand years ago and those boats were not these huge very sturdy ship that we travel on their boats that are quite shallow uh and flat and, and not as uh as sturdy as is um you know our boats uh, maybe would be when you say a ship a boat a yacht so so this and, and they were open okay and you have these disciples you have these 12 people in that boat and the winds are rocking them in such a severe way that it buffets them the winds are against them and it threatens to capsize them they are rowing they are doing everything that they can to stay alive because they find themselves in a life-threatening situation and their lives are at stake this is what's happening and it's only a few hours after they experience the miraculous work of God in their midst. But in the midst of the crisis, it's hard to remember who holds the crisis. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them. So, so it pinpoints the time that's when these winds would come kind of like suddenly on uh, the water. And so he decided to go on to them. Walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were what excited to see him. They shouted, hey, Jesus, you're here and we know you can do miracles and we can relinquish now our fear into your hands. We know you're present and things are going to be all right. No, none of that. It says, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. 
But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. What an amazing passage that as I prayed and I was considering what are we going to bring here to finish our prayer segment. We have done uh, this whole month focus on prayer and we talked about what is prayer, how to pray. And I promised you that I'm going to also tell you <laughs> how do you receive answer to prayer? We said we're going to talk about that. And we began with James, you know, chapter one. And we read this passage where it said, hey, you can ask anything. You can ask for wisdom from the Lord, whatever you lack when you examine yourself, when you do, do this deep dive, like when you do the deep dive at the beginning of a year and you find where you lack, then ask Jesus for wisdom. And the reason it says wisdom is because Jesus needs to give you insights on what you really need to fill the lack with, because sometimes we're asking for things that are totally not according to God's will in our lives. But then, but then when we ask for wisdom, God gives us insights and we are asking him according to his will, then he gives us. But if we doubt, James says, you're going to receive nothing. And here we read in this passage that Peter prayed. He asked because prayer is asking from a deep craving of the heart. We're asking God for what we crave. So Peter is asking Jesus and Jesus responds with yes. And Peter begins to experience the miracle. And he begins to sing in the middle of the experiencing of the miracle. Because he doubt it. So we're just going to really unpack this because I am excited for what we're going to learn. And if we learn this and begin to practice it and listen to me, what you're going to learn today is not what you've never heard before. It probably would be something you've heard before, but you don't usually practice because even the followers of Jesus, the very first followers of Jesus that were in his presence all the time had hard time practicing it. The first thing we need to know is that Jesus is always in the storm. Jesus is always in the storm, but the thing is, his activity in the storm may look something completely different than you've ever seen before. And because you're frightened, because there are terrifying circumstances, because there is depression, grief, because there is desperation, lack of hope, because there is sickness, and because there is death, and because there is unwellness, we transfer all of that onto the Lord. As though whatever activity we see in the storm comes from the enemy. Let me take you through the scripture we just read. So there is a storm. And by the way, don't blame God for the storm. Jesus told us in John 16, in this world, there will be many trials, but take heart, I overcame the many trials, the storms that come in your life. Jesus is not the storm. He doesn't bring the evil in the world. One day, actually, he would completely eradicate all evil from the 
the world. But but at this point, he overcame the world, the evil. So if we rest in Jesus, then we can rest in the overcomer and see his result, his peace and calmness in the midst of the storm. But so a lot of a lot of people want to blame God for the storms of life. And they first of all blame him and tell him he is the cause of no, he is not. He just comes in to calm the storm. This is what Jesus came to do. At the end, he, you know, when the, when he got to the boat, he calmed the storm. But in the midst of it, he had to first calm their hearts because what they perceived Jesus to be is the opposite of who Jesus was. Jesus is always present in the storm. Often his activity, we think, is the activity of the enemy of our souls. This is what they said. Oh my goodness, it's a ghost. This is just like from the evil side of things. This is what we see. They saw Jesus walking on the water. They just saw Jesus, Jesus making this amazing provision miracle. So they should have known, oh my goodness, we were just in the presence of the miracle maker. Maybe that's the miracle maker coming again to calm the storm because we are in the midst of crisis. But that's not what it came to mind. What came to mind because they were already terrified. They transferred all of those feelings onto Jesus and blamed him that the activities they see God do in the midst of the storm is the activity of the enemy of their souls. Friends, let's not do this. Let's not blame God. And in the midst of these two years of a long crisis that the entire world has been going through, I just want to set something straight. God is not the giver of the evil things. Scripture says he is the giver of all good things. And he comes in the midst of the storm. He is coming in the midst of this COVID storm, not because he is causing that storm, but to calm the storm and to say, you know that I'm the overcomer. Where is your faith? Why are you doubting? Relinquish to me the things you are now seeing you cannot control. You cannot control your health fully and completely because I am the giver of life. And in that life, there is health. Give that to me. Ask me for the solution of this crisis. Ask me for the well-being of the mental well-being of the human beings on this planet. Ask me to come in and restore shattered economies. Ask me because I can see how you have crumbled at all. You are trying to control and hold on to the crisis as though you can fully be in control because the disciples were rowing and they were trying to stay afloat in this boat, but they were about to be capsized, turned over because there is circumstances, natural and other circumstances, both outside and within us, that at some point we are at the end of our rope and we cannot control. And Jesus is coming in the midst of that storm to say, I am in control. I am the overcomer. I am in the midst of that storm, but you need to recognize me not as the enemy, just because you don't recognize my activity. He was walking on water. They've never seen a human being walk on water. Granted, he's the Messiah. And he was able to walk on water. But even Peter was able to walk on water when he had faith in the water walking Messiah. But just because they didn't recognize the activity, just because you and I may not be able to recognize the activity in the midst of the storm, let's not blame God that he is the enemy. Let's allow God to come as our friend to come our storm. Because I'll tell you this, this thing. When we recognize that Jesus is in the midst of every storm, then we have the option to do two things. 
And how we going to do that, what option we're going to take will change our lives and it will turn it forever. And I'm telling you, this is the thing I want you to jot down because it truly changes lives and it will change your life. When you recognize that Jesus is in the midst of your storm, you can either look upon Jesus or you can look upon your circumstance. And you're like, oh, it's not like I have never heard that. Oh, let me tell you what you need to really know and begin to do by hearing this one more time. You can look on Jesus. And when you look on Jesus, when you see Jesus, again, you first need to recognize it is Jesus in your circumstance and not your enemy, right? It is Jesus who comes in to prepare the soil of your heart to understand the seed he's planting so you can be fruitful human being, so you can grow and mature and display God and put his beauty and, and goodness to bless others as he's blessing you. But after you realize it is God's activity in your life that he is using everything that the enemy meant for evil, Romans 8, 28, and God turns it for you good. Not that God brought the evil, but he turns the evil. And now he's going to use it for good. He can only use it for good this way. For you to look upon Jesus and you will rise in faith. And write this. You will rise in water walking faith. This is a supernatural absolutely at a different level faith this is not faith to say oh yeah i can feed my family because i really still have 10 bucks left in my wallet and i can go buy bread from the store that's not faith that doesn't take faith i know you might be low on cash but that has nothing to do with a water walking miracle it is like when you're completely bankrupt and when when you are almost homeless that God comes in and changes your circumstances and then he replenishes he restores he brings you up this is a water walking faith so when you see Jesus in the storm you have the option to look upon Jesus when you look upon Jesus you rise up in faith that you too can partner with God to experience a supernatural miracle. Listen to me. This is what you're rising up in faith. When you lock eyes with Jesus, you are in partnership. This gaze, when you're that focused on the miracle maker, this gaze this locking of seeing you are seeing the miracle maker at work with activities that are completely supernatural in the midst of your storm and now you rose up to water walking miraculous activity in your own life but that miracle does not come unless you partner with the miracle maker wow why do we rise up to the water walking activity in our lives to that miraculous activity because in the midst of the storm there is circumstances that break our control and we have to just relinquish control because we can't like in this particular case you know they were fearful for their lives we just cannot you know like like the storm and the waves you know they couldn't control so in the middle of the storm, the crisis breaks your pride and it lets you relinquish. But the other thing also that happens is you gladly do that because you see the supernatural, miraculous steps that Jesus makes in your natural, horrific circumstances. And then because Peter recognized that Jesus is walking on the water, he, in the midst of the scariest time, wants to do this. This is where his faith rose. In the midst of these winds and waves that were about to capsize, he says, I want to come and walk on water too.
just like how are you doing? He asked for that, and Jesus says, you can. You're okay then. You can come. Because yes, you can do that just as I am doing it. You will partner with me now. And Peter gets out of the boat, steps on these destabilizing. Do you realize how unstable his world was at that time? His entire world was being shaken back and forth, back and forth, and was buffeted by winds that actually created these waves that were going to capsize and drown him. But in the midst of that scary situation, his faith rose to that level that he is saying, I can live the little bitty safety I have because the boat was the safety. They were afraid that they would drown and, and capsize, but, but that was his safety at that point. But his faith rose to that level that he was willing to live his safety, partner with Jesus to experience a miracle that completely crushed his control over the situation. He let go of the control. He locked gaze. His eyes were gazing on Jesus and the miraculous activity of Jesus in the midst of the storm. And he said, here I am. I relinquish my control. Help me do the walk, the miracle together with you. The thing is that for you and me to experience God's miraculous work in our lives, we partner with Jesus. He didn't sit on a couch somewhere in the stern on a cushion or something. He didn't go hide on the bottom of the boat. I really don't know if there was a hole somewhere. He didn't crawl in a hole and say, Jesus, save! Jesus, come the waters! No, he said, I will be so bold to say, I will step on the destabilizer of my life. When your faith rises to that level, that Jesus can come even the destabilizer and you're ready to partner with Jesus to step and walk on the destabilizer of your life, then the very destabilizer becomes your propeller of faith. The very waves became the propeller of Peter's faith. He said, I too can walk on water. If my Jesus can do this miracle, I can partner with Jesus and do that. Amazing, miraculous work that God can do in our lives right now in 2022 in our horrible circumstances. I don't know what you're going through right now, but I just want to tell you that Jesus is right there. He didn't cause the horrible circumstances in your lives. Let me put that straight. But he's in the midst of that crisis that the enemy had meant for your evil. He can turn it for good. But he is looking for you to see him and not to blame these activities on the enemy because he is coming in and his presence is so overwhelming and miraculous. Get a grasp on that presence and partner with him. Rise, see. Peter saw that Jesus, in the midst of this, the destabilizing crisis, Jesus can perform miracles that a Lord, that he is Lord over that destabilizer. Because when he saw that Jesus can walk on waves, then Peter understood Jesus had overcome the waves. So the waves, the destabilizers, became Peter's faith propellers. But I told you you have two options. One is that option that you can lock gaze with Jesus, you can see Jesus, understand he's in your midst, and he can do that supernatural work in your life, and he can overcome the destabilizers. But then Peter went with the second choice. I mean, he already was out of the boat, began to partner with Jesus in this miracle water walking experience and then he chose because this is a choice we have God doesn't turn your head to look to the le left to look to the right Peter 
had a choice to keep his eyes on Jesus or to turn to the left or to the right. And that's exactly what he did. He turned his gaze and then he gazed. He saw the circumstance. He began to look on the destabilizers, but when you only look on your circumstance and see why you are on a shaky ground without also looking upon the one who controls the destabilizers, who controls the shaking, who controls the crisis, then you begin to sink. If you look on your circumstance, on your crisis, then you fail. When you look on Jesus, you rise in faith. When you look on the crisis, you fall in doubt. And this is exactly what happened. Peter, Peter's heart fainted of fear. That's what that word means. He was so deeply disturbed. He began the miracle. He experienced the miracle. Yet, because he took his gaze what we choose to see listen my friend what we choose to see and look upon and gaze and allow to feed our perception our understanding of life impacts our life for good or for bad so you cannot allow to look at things that would continue to shake your world if you or in an anxiety kind of a pattern, if you're depressed, if you're dealing with grief, and you continue to look upon all kinds of bad reports, all kinds of things that, that bring you down, that continue to feed the fear, then you will continue to sink. But if you begin to look on Jesus, and read what he does in his word, what he does with the circumstances that are stormy, that are destabilizing in life, and the way he overcomes these circumstances. When you begin to see Jesus' miraculous activity in the midst of your crisis, then you will rise up again to faith. But as Peter made a choice to see the crisis, I don't know why he did that, Maybe some of the waves splashed so hard on him and was about to fall or something. I don't know what made him a lot of times these destabilizers in our lives stretches to our thinnest point. But in that point, you have to practice high faith, rise to a water walking faith. He should have continued exactly at that point when the waves, when the wet you know, just overcame him when he couldn't breathe from the small little bitty water mist around his nostrils, when maybe his mouth got full of water and he was thinking he was going to drown. At that time is not the time to take your gaze off Jesus. You keep seeing Jesus. You keep looking upon Jesus because at that time you turn around and start looking at your circumstance and at your crisis. It is guaranteed you will sink and the crisis will overcome you instead of allowing the overcomer of the crisis to bring his supernatural miracle in your life. I just want to call upon that faith that I know is in you. This is the one thing I want you to remember that the when we see Jesus in our crisis, in the storm, the very destabilizers can become the very propellers of your faith. But it only happens if you see Jesus, keep looking upon Jesus, and never look back on the destabilizers. Before everything when come, the storm was still raging on and Peter was still walking on the waves. See, there is a period between the supernatural activity of God in the midst of your storm and when the storm goes calm and there is no more storm. And this is where we practice this water walking faith that we rose up to because 
Peter saw Jesus can. Jesus walked on water, meaning this is a supernatural work that the overcomer of that circumstance, of that crisis, Jesus Christ, can do. And he partnered to experience that. And when you're in partnership with God, do not ever let go of the hand, of the look, of the gaze of God. Stay focused on it. Peter didn't. He looked upon the destabilizer and chose to stay there with his gaze. And he began to sink. But thank God that any time we begin to sink, Jesus is close by. Jesus was within reach. He immediately stretched his hand, picked him up, stabilized him again over the destabilizing waves. What do you think? It became calm as soon as Jesus? No, Jesus picked him up and the waves were still buffeting and the waves were still capsizing the, the boat and the waves were still going on. But now Peter was able to hold on to Jesus. Jesus was holding on to Peter and they get into the boat and that's when the storm come down. So friend, there are seasons in life and we are in one of those seasons when we are experiencing strong destabilizers. It is a crisis of a proportion that your generation and the generations that are living around you have never seen. The storm is so strong that the waves around you seem that they're capsizing your boat and you will drown for sure. But I'm telling you, Jesus is in the midst of the storm. Jesus is never absent. God's activity is never absent from any place in the entire universe. He is right here and he is waiting on us to turn to him and ask him to overcome our crisis, to relinquish the control that we think we have. And we're coming to the end of ourselves. We're coming to the end of recognizing now we cannot control at all. And God is looking upon us. He's seeing us. He's coming into our storm to calm the storm and to restore to refresh, to bring us again hope and a future. He knows the plans he has for you. It is for all of the people that call upon him that he has plans to prosper us and not to harm us. Everyone who believes on his son, Jesus Christ, these are the plans of God to give us hope and a future. But you and I have to let go of what we cannot control anyhow and rise up in faith rise up stand on the very destabilizers partnering with jesus to see his miracle in the midst of your crisis never go back to look at your destabilizers in your crisis lock eyes with jesus here are my questions i wrote them down because as I prayed, this is what I felt the Holy Spirit is nudging me to ask you. And this is what I want you to write down and to answer. And be very honest. If you want, put the answers in um, your comments. The Zoom group and I will be chatting after that. And we will have some time to pray and listen to the Lord. But here are the questions. Do you see Jesus? in this current storm that you're going through and it is stretching even through the beginning of 2022. He's right there, but his activity, and listen to me, this is what the Holy Spirit put on my heart to, to write. He is in the midst of this crisis, but his activity looks quite different from any other time we have seen him move in the lives of humanity. It looks different. 
do we see it? Or do we blame even God's activity on the enemy of the human soul? So that's the first question. Because unless we see Jesus and we see his miraculous activity in the midst of the storm, it is hard to then partner with Jesus in the midst of the storm, right? Unless we trust and believe he is in the midst of it and we begin to see and allow some of the things that God is deconstructing then to construct again, but in a brand new way. We grieve over things that maybe God is putting us under. Maybe God is shaking. Maybe God is allowing certain things so we can loosen human control over the very institution of his body that we call the church. Because the church is not a building. The church is not some um, very famed individual that leads a group of people. The church is the body of the only famed individual that ever lived in this world and his name is Jesus Christ. And God doesn't share fame with anybody. So God is coming to do a new work in the world. So I'm asking you, do you see him in the midst of the crisis we are experiencing? The second thing I wrote down that I truly felt, listen to me, the Holy Spirit is asking you and you answer that. Will you rise in water walking faith? When you walk on water, that type of faith is different from, I'm just going to go buy a loaf of bread because somebody gave me some money on the street. Water walking faith is completely different. It walks on the destabilizers. It tramples the destabilizers. Peter was able to walk on the very waves that frightened their lives. And then this is what really is the crux of the matter that I feel the Holy Spirit is asking you to prayerfully know from him. What miracle will you ask God for in 2022? What miracle? What water walking miracle are you asking God for? Because if you're not asking him, then he's not going to give you that miracle. Because there were 12 people in this boat. Only one of them experienced the water walking miracle as he partnered with Jesus. Now they all experienced the benefit of that. Because Jesus came, they saw Peter also walking on water. Then Peter and Jesus got to the boat and the storm was calmed down. But the Holy Spirit is stirring your heart right now to listen to God with wisdom and to ask him for what you need to do in 2022 to proclaim the name of Jesus so his name will be famous in the earth. How are you going to put God in display in a miraculous fashion when you partner with his activity in the storm, in your life, and in your sphere of influence? So, to conclude, will you partner with God in his supernatural activity and not doubt his work on your behalf? Because it wasn't Peter's work in walking. He knew how to walk on solid ground. No human being knows how to walk on water. It was God's activity, but Peter partnered with God. So will you rise in faith and not doubt? Because if you don't doubt, then you will see God's activity in your life. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we come before you and we are praying that you would seal this word in our hearts, that you will so strongly impress on us to not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word, that we will seek after you to know what you are stirring our hearts to ask you for, that what a walking miracle that you will do in 2022 and we will partner with you to see your activity in the midst of the crisis. Friend, if you have not received Jesus Christ yet as your personal Lord and Savior, 
because he is the only one that had overcome the entire crisis in this entire world, then we just want to invite you to receive him as your personal Lord and Savior. What does that mean? It means that you give Jesus everything, all the junk, all of your past, everything that you've sinned. You bring your marred, broken existence. He puts it together. He forgives you. He washes you, makes you clean. Your slate is clean. And then you begin to partner with Jesus in doing life and seeing his miraculous activity in your life. Let's go ahead and pray. If you've never asked the Lord, or if you want to recommit your life in that fashion, because maybe you've known about Jesus, you just haven't experienced him in that way. Let's pray right now and invite him like that. And write in the comments that you received Jesus today, or you recommitted your life to Jesus. You can just simply say, Jesus, I give you my life. I give you all of my sinful past, everything that I've done wrong and everything that I done good, but it doesn't measure up to your goodness standard. I give you all and I thank you for cleansing me, washing me, and then giving me a new slate so I can follow you and partner with you to see your miraculous work in my life. Amen. Friend, if that's the prayer you prayed, I just want to welcome you into the family of God. Join us. Let us know that you made a decision for Jesus. Again, uh, friends, you're welcome to come and be a part of Real Life Church. We are an online community, but we are very much relationally connected and activating each other into the works of the Lord in this world. We just want to say goodbye to you. We're going to continue in our Zoom group, and actually we will share what the Lord has been putting in our heart for 2022 what to ask, what type of miracle walking he is asking us to do, partnering with him to see this crisis being calmed. Bye-bye, friends. Share this word. Is it blessed you? Let it bless others.